There's that famous passage where Ananda mentions to the Buddha that dependent core rising, the explanation of how suffering comes about, appears to be difficult, but actually is very clear. And the Buddha says, don't say that. It not only appears to be difficult, it is difficult. And that statement has scared a lot of people off the topic. And you could spend months and months on the topic and get confused, which is why a lot of people don't like to go there, don't like to study it. But if there's nothing else you take away from the way the Buddha explains the causes of suffering, take away this one point. Contact at the senses is not the starting point. It comes after a lot of other factors, which means that the factors for suffering are already in place by the time you hear something or see something or think something. In other words, the mind is primed to suffer. It's primed for suffering, even before anything happens. And that's what we're trying to undo here as we practice. We approach life, we approach our experience through the senses with all the wrong attitudes. And the purpose of meditation is to replace those wrong attitudes with more skillful attitudes, so you can undo the suffering, you can avoid the suffering, and ultimately put an end to suffering. So keep this point in mind. When your kids run screaming around the house and it drives you crazy, it's not the kids screaming and running around the house that's making you suffer. It's your attitudes. When a relationship gets difficult, again, it's your attitude. This is not to pass judgment on whether the kids should be screaming and running around the house or not, but the fact that you're suffering from it, that's something that's totally unnecessary. So what you want to do is look at your attitudes and look at where you can straighten them out, make them more skillful. As the Buddha said, it starts with ignorance. And it's not just general ignorance, it's a specific kind of ignorance. You're not looking at things in the right way. In other words, where is there suffering? What's causing it? And what can you do to put an end to it? Those are the questions you should be asking. Those questions are the ones that line up with what the Buddha calls appropriate attention. If you're not asking in those terms, you're focusing on something else, your priorities are all mixed up. Or even if they're clear, they're, they're out of order, which means you're missing a lot of the important stuff that's going on in terms of forming suffering. As the Buddha said, from ignorance of the issue of suffering comes fabrication. And there are three kinds of fabrication. There's bodily, and there's verbal, and there's mental. Bodily fabrication is the breath coming in going out. In other words, if you're breathing in ignorance, you're already setting yourself up to suffer. Say you're driving home, dreading getting back home that evening because a difficult relative is there. And as you think about it, your breath is already getting strange. It's already getting unhealthy. And then comes the verbal fabrication, thinking about what the relative did and passing judgment on the relative, passing judgment on your ability to deal with the relative. In other words, all the kind of issues that get you all primed so that when you actually step out of the car and meet the relative, you're, going to, you're in a bad mood already. Physically, you don't feel right. And the mind has been churning with all these different ideas that are really not helpful. And then finally there's the feelings and the perceptions, all the labels you put on things. And as psychologists have shown, you can have lots of different potential configurations in any situation that you could label as the figure against the ground. It's called gestalt. 
And as you think about it, there are lots of things that you could be labeling at any one particular time. You could be thinking of your life in sort of geological time, in which case the, the issues seem very minor and not worth getting worked up about at all. You could think about your uncle, your relative, in all kinds of different ways, in biological issues. You could approach it from a psychologist's point of view. You could approach it from the fact that you're the, the victim in the relationship. Given the way you think about it, there are different labels you're going to apply to your feelings and to the actions that happen. And that's not all. There are lots of other factors between fabrication and the time you actually say something or hear something from the relative when you get out of the car. But here already, physically and mentally, you're primed to suffer. And a lot of this is because we lack skills. Go back to that issue of ignorance. It's not just knowledge about suffering. It's knowledge, one, in terms of suffering, i.e. you look at the situation in those terms, and then you realize that there are specific duties with regard to each of those Four Noble Truths. The suffering or the stress is something you want to comprehend. You want to actually be able to look at it and see what it is and where it's coming from. Once you see where it's coming from, you see the origination of suffering, that's something you want to let go of. Now, For most of us, we want to let go of the suffering without understanding the cause. As I say, you're performing the, the wrong duty. There's a story about Jokun No was a, a famous monk in Bangkok in the middle of the century. He was doing walking meditation late one night, and there was this one young monk who was being driven crazy by thoughts about his family, thoughts about his situation. He came running to see Jacques Noah, and he was talking about it. These thoughts, I just can't get them out of my head. And Jacques Noah says, well, you're performing the wrong duty. Turned around went inside his hut. The monk went back. Unfortunately, the monk was someone who had studied the Four Noble Truths, and he knew the teaching on the duties. Suffering is something you want to comprehend. It's not something you try to push away. Or if you feed the thoughts, you're developing the suffering. Developing is something you should do with a path. You try to develop concentration. You try to develop virtue. You try to develop all the other factors of the path, discernment. So the first thing you've got to do is look at your situation in terms of these four categories and then apply the right duties to each. And there's some suffering that comes up, some stress comes up. You don't immediately just want to push it away. It's like having a problem child in your house. The child's a problem, so you push him out of the house. Does that solve the problem? No. It actually makes it worse. Because then the child is running around with his friends and getting into all kinds of trouble. You don't know what's going on. And it's the same with your suffering. If you don't sit with it for a while, you're not going to understand it. If you don't understand it, how can you deal with it in an effective way? So suffering is to be understood, comprehended. The cause is what you let go, i.e. the craving and the ignorance and all the other mental factors that grow out of the ignorance. The path is something you want to develop, you try to develop right view all the way through right concentration, so that when stress does end, whether it ends temporarily or permanently, you want to be able to witness it, notice it, oh, this is what's happening. That stress I was feeling actually has gone away. Seeing this gives you a lot of encouragement. It gives you a sense you really know what you're doing, and you develop a skill. And this is the important thing about ignorance in the Buddhist teachings. It's not an either-or. It's not that you're totally ignorant or totally knowledgeable and without any gradation in between. It's in those forms of Buddhist philosophy where the ignorance is about, say, your Buddha nature or something like that, where either you know it or you don't which means there's no gradual path, there's no gradual understanding. But here it's more of an, uh, the kind of knowledge that comes as a skill, something you develop over time. So you get more and more skillful at comprehending the suffering, more and more skillful at letting go of its cause, more and more skillful at developing the path, and so on.
sort of learning how to bring skills into the situation. So when you're looking at things in these terms, and you breathe with knowledge, you don't breathe in ignorance. And if you breathe with knowledge, you find you can get a lot more out of the breath. This is why we spend so much time practicing with the breath, getting sensitive to how the breathing affects the body, how the breathing affects the mind. So you can bring this aspect to your life, i.e. the way your body feels, and make it part of the path to the end of suffering, instead of just being one more thing you suffer from. So in this way, when you're in difficult situations, you at least know that well, I can breathe in a way that's not adding any suffering. Everything from standing in a long line at the supermarket to being tortured in prison. You can still breathe in a way that minimizes the suffering. And then with the direct of thought and evaluation, again, we, this is what we practice with as we're meditating. You direct your thoughts for the time being to the breath, and then you learn how to evaluate the breath. What kind of breathing is good for you? What kind of breathing is not? This will take time, because sometimes you get enamored with a particular way of breathing. And you stick with it for a long time, and you begin to realize, hey, this is not as good as I thought it was. Okay, you've learned something. You begin to sense what kind of breathing is needed in any particular situation. And then there are their feelings and the perceptions. Again, here the, the main perception is learning to look at everything that happens in the body in terms of breath. The way you sense your hands, the way you sense your feet, your legs, your torso, your neck, your head. Think of it all in terms of part of a breathing process. And then you notice that certain feelings will come from those perceptions. So this way, instead of being primed for suffering, you've got the skills to prime yourself not to suffer. That's what's going to make all the difference in the world, because there's so much in terms of what you're going to see and hear and smell and taste and touch and think about in life. That's just a given. You can't prevent certain events from happening, but you can prime yourself in such a way that you don't have to suffer from those events when they do come. So as you're on your way to meet the relative, you sense that your breath is getting strange, so immediately focus on the breath. Try to be as refreshed as possible in the way you breathe. And then you've learned to have a greater range in, what, in terms of how you think about the issue, how you evaluate the issue, because you've learned that thinking and evaluating is something you can, you can manipulate. This, of course, is where not, it's not just a question of having practice in meditation. It's good to hang around people who know how to speak in diff difficult situations so you can pick up some of their skills. How to perceive things, what feelings to focus on, what feelings to let go. You learn some from your own exploration and some from having good examples around. But the important thing is that you realize that you have more choices than you thought you had. And you've learned to look at things you know, from the right point of view, the perspective of appropriate attention, asking the questions about, well, where is the stress here? What am I doing that's causing unnecessary, useless stress? And what can be done about it? When you learn to bring that attitude, then regardless of the situation you face outside or emotions that come up inside, memories of the past anticipations of the future, you can approach them with skill. You've got your body and your breath on your side. You've got your thinking processes on your side. And that enables you to negotiate all kinds of difficulties that can come from outside. So if nothing else, when you think about the whole issue of suffering and stress in your life, remind yourself it's what you're primed for that makes all the difference. If you're primed to suffer, no matter what happens, 
you're going to suffer. If you're bringing skills to the situation, then you've got a chance that you don't have to suffer. This is why, as the Buddha said, the difference between a wise person and a foolish person is the wise person sees that the necessity for training the mind. The foolish person doesn't see that at all. Unfortunately, wisdom and foolishness have nothing to do with your genetic background or your educational background. You've got the choice. Do you want to be wise or foolish? Do you want to be primed to approach the world skillfully, or do you want to be primed to suffer? You've got the choice. It takes time to move from suffering and stress to total freedom from suffering and stress. But again, it's not an either-or. It's a gradual process. As you follow the path, you find that different things that used to make you suffer don't make you suffer anymore. The world may be pretty much the same as it was before. Or as someone said right now, it seems like the world's going to hell on a greased pole. But you don't have to slide down the greased pole with everybody else. The situ situation outside, events outside, may be something we all have in common. But the amount we suffer is something purely individual. And it's a question of skill and lack of skill. So keep these points in mind.